Hello and welcome to the EduTalk series hosted by Biotone, Biotone Edu Partner Program and massage industry experts. With the challenges that have faced massage schools, students and practicing therapists over the last year, thanks to COVID, the EduTalk series supports virtual learning and building massage community by connecting you with industry experts who share their knowledge and expertise not only for class discussion, but career success. Tonight's expert is Shamaya Cha, an active LMT with over 44 years of healing arts experience, both as a clinician and educator of anatomy, physiology, and physical medicine. She's a CE provider and has written numerous curriculums. Her intent of increasing the quality of life for her clients drives her success and interest in sharing her knowledge with you through this EduTalk tonight. Let's listen and learn as Shamaya explains the what, why, and how of medical massage in a nutshell. She'll discuss systemic effects of injury and techniques to help reduce, even correct, the symptoms. She'll review the importance of understanding pre-existing contraindications, and how a medical massage approach can assist your clients to health, well-being, and recovery. Thank you for joining us tonight. And before I turn it over to Shamaya, please um, use speaker view and be sure you are muted and video is off. Um, with that, Shamaya, Thank you for joining us and it's all yours. Thank you so much and hello everybody. I did also want to let you know that um, they would like your questions to be reserved until the end of the uh, meeting and that you could post them in the chat box which you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom. So hi everybody, I'm really excited to be here and I see a lot of my uh, previous students that I've had. I know that you know that I see you, so shout out to you and also a shout out to, I see Sandy Fritz is in the audience and uh, she's one of the other educators that I know has been around for as about as long as I have, more than 40 years and doing education for over 35. I also know that she's going to be uh, giving us a conversation or a uh, lecture to you guys in August sometime. So do check in because she's terrific. And I've used her books in teaching in the massage schools that I've been in. So hi, Sandy. Well, the whole thing about medical massage, it's been a really big uh, part of everything that I've done uh, in the massage therapy field. And it started like a, about 35 years ago that we started promoting it as medical massage. You know that when you uh, bill insurance, we're listed as a uh, current physician terminology is massage therapy and any kind of manual therapeutic technique that we do is done because we have a license to do so and that we can be reimbursed for those um, applications as a licensed professional. So the reality of medical massage, what is it? How is it different from regular massage or Swedish massage? Um, in the very beginning, it was listed as mas medical massage is when a person has a prescription from a physician that has seen them, that has diagnosed them with a condition that would benefit from the physical medicine applications you will be providing under the terms of massage therapy. It doesn't mean that we can't treat people who have medical conditions, but the reality is the physician primarily does the assessment and the diagnosis, and then we are given the instructions on what body parts to work on, and we pick and choose the techniques um, that are necessary. With that in mind, we want to not withhold our skills, so it's really important to assess the situation uh, prior, even if you have a prescription, just assess, or if you're not assessing, then you're guessing. So it's really important to rule out a lot of things that could be potentially uh, harmful to that person if you're going to do any kind of manipulation. So as a massage therapist, and I'm coming strictly from massage, is that you know, we treat four conditions as massage therapists when dealing with injury. We treat a sustained contraction, we treat an increase in tissue waste, we treat a decrease of elasticity, and an increase in fascial adhesions. 
The reason why I have listed it in that sequence is because that's how it happens in the body. So there are a lot of changes that occur just from our body protecting itself upon the impact of injury. So if we were to take a look at this, you know, in order for a muscle to contract, you know, regardless of the type of contraction you have, it requires an energy. And a contraction is a contraction is a contraction. I don't, I don't mean that uh, it's, it's all that happens in the action of movement or non-movement, but I'm talking about what actually goes on on the inside of the cells of a muscle. So a skeletal muscle being not just for a function of movement and protection um, as far as layering goes, but it's important to understand one of the things that we do upon impact to reduce pain, we tighten up. And the reason we tighten up is because as we have that impact on a tense muscle, it reduces the sensation of pain. So, you know, when you become impacted and you're injured, the first message your brain tells you is that tension decreases pain. And then we know as a massage therapist, if that's sustained, if you have continued tension, we want to relax that. But if you relax after you've been impacted, then your pain increases. So that's the second message your brain gives you. It winds up starting this cyclic mechanism um, that doesn't shut off until you mechanically shut that off. So I just want to give it kind of simply, uh, if, if muscle is going to contract, it uses a minimum of four energies. And those four energies being acetylcholine, adenosine triphosphate, oxygen, and proteins. Uh, when you use those energies, you yield a waste product that is acidic. Now, uh, back in 1985, I read a book by Dr. Robert Becker, who wrote the book, The Body Electric. And he substantiated that the waste product from uh, muscle contraction has a positive polarity. It has a positive charge. He also substantiated that blood has a positive charge. So if you remember playing with magnets when you were a kid, um, like poles repel and opposite to tract. When you think about the function of blood, which is in the action of transportation, it brings good things to the, to the cells and takes away the bad things from the cells. But if you have waste product that has a positive charge and your blood has a positive charge, it's difficult uh, for that process of diffusion to occur because of the like poles causing the repelling of those uh, products and not allowing it to get into the blood vascular system. So because of that, we wind up having an equilibration across the cell membrane from the blood vessels, and that would inhibit the process of diffusion. The other thing that happens is in the process of filtration, when you have more push on one side of a membrane than another, you, as in capillary filtration, you wind up with uh, fluid leaking out of the blood vessels and entering into the interstitial space. Well, if you have a muscle cell pushing on a blood vessel that is having fluid push through it, you wind up again with an equilibration across the membrane so that the process of filtration. Those are the two functional ways that we move things out of our body in and out of our body, and the other processes are not really functional here. So that becomes a problem. Um, what happens is when you take blood out of an organ, if the tissue is becoming ischemic, you wind up decreasing its functionary activity. So you wind up having uh, the predisposition for continued injury or um, just dysfunction of uh, the tissues and the kinetic chain. So one of the things I wanted to share with you is that we have this mechanism, it's actually known as a two neuron reflex arc, that when we have sensations coming into our body that are noxious or excessively painful, we have a process where information comes into the central nervous system and comes right back out. In front, an afferent neuron going right out at an efferent neuron. It doesn't make it up to your brain for you to decide, should I, should I not stay there? Uh, the example I always give is if you were to put your hand on a hot stove, you don't just leave your hand there and say, ooh, I think I smell flesh burning, let me move my hand off. It doesn't happen that way. You put your hand on a hot stove and the whole upper quadrant moves to remove you from that area. So you wind up with this information coming in. The motor response is about 10 times or more stronger than the sensation coming into the body. So imagine, and I'm going to have to have you look at my fingers and my hands in this uh, as an just as a demonstration, if this was a nerve and this was a blood vessel and this was a muscle and I squeezed, while well, sensory information coming into the central nervous system and coming back out again is going to cause con contraction. The muscle is contracting, the nerve is being irritated, sensory information comes in and comes back out stronger in contraction. Now that the muscle is still squeezing on those blood vessels, the tissue becomes ischemic and we have a buildup of acid. And then we say, ow, sensory information coming in, 
coming back out 10 times or more stronger in contraction. So we wind up with this cyclic mechanism of a tension patterning that is meant to protect us in the acute stages of injury. But as it continues, unless we get to shut that contraction off, well, then what will happen, it will become uh, continued and chronic and then can set up a whole lot of systemic dysfunction, which we're gonna talk about now. So one of the things that I share when I'm teaching the medical massage is that, you know, when you, you're looking at a trigger point and a trigger point is an accumulation of these waste products that when you manipulate them, they refer pain elsewhere in the body, right? So we talked about a couple of things here. We talked about the uh, tissue waste being one of the contributory factors for continued muscle contraction after you have an impacted injury or development of increased tissue waste. Um, an example, you know, you have some with fibromyalgia, that is actually a condition of uh, an area of accumulation of uh, waste products that have been encapsulated uh, generally because the body doesn't want to uh, allow those, those waste products to go into the blood vascular system if their other organs of elimination have already been encapsulated, uh, I'm sorry, have already been uh, compromised. So we wind up encapsulating those waste products and it creates a little fibrotic not there. Uh, most people who have fibromyalgia complain about burning when they move. Um, so it's a body's mechanism to take all of the waste product that is not serving and put it in the periphery if your body cannot eliminate it as quick as you're putting um, not nutritious things into your body and or experiencing stress and or other medications that will leave a, a, a residual of waste product. So in dealing with that two neuron reflex arc, you wind up again with this cyclic mechanism of systemic pain. And then what happens is, is that, I'm sorry, cyclic pain, is it while it's being continued, you wind up having this decreased awareness of a constant state of uh, tension. So you wind up not realizing that your body is tight because if you, what happens is you have this place in your brain that in the somatosensory cortex, it, it doesn't want you to have to take all of your attention to every little bitty thing that's happening in your life for you to take care of it. If we, otherwise you'll wind up not being able to perform all your other daily functions. So an example of that is uh, when you have people who come in and they're tight and they're wearing their shoulders up here like earrings, then no, they're tight. You know, you do your little magic on them and they drop their shoulders down here. And they're like, wow, how do you feel? And they say, I feel the same. And it's like, what do you mean you feel the same? Your shoulders are six inches lower, you're more relaxed. And they don't correlate that with what their uh, sensory information is that they're knowing, oh yeah, I'm more relaxed. They don't really have that in their consciousness. So much like that, uh, when we're experiencing tension, people don't know how tight they really are until after we relax them. It's kind of like, you know, if you were to put stockings on in the morning, you know those stockings are there and your brain says you got stockings on, you got stockings on, you got stockings on, and then you go about your day, you don't know you have them on anymore until you go to take them off. Your brain has accepted that as a uh, constant uh, information, sensory information coming in. And as long as it's not detrimental, it takes it out of your consciousness. So it's, it's away from your everyday functioning. Um, but if you had something that was detrimental, like if you had a bulging disc or a bone sitting on a nerve, your body's going to always tell you you have pain and you, because it's an alerting mechanism and you need to do something about it without, you know, so that you don't wind up losing the loss of that nerve and potentially lose the ability to uh, walk. I'm sorry, I'm going to shut my phone off. Okay, so we have that going on it's when there's a decreased chronic stimulation, a decreased awareness of a chronic stimulation. Now, what happens is, is that when you wind up uh, with these waste products and you wind up with, with muscles tearing, okay, so if you have uh, muscles that they are, their fibers are arranged this way, so that if in fact you wind up with an injury, your tissue repairs itself fibrotically after that injury, but that fibrotic reparation is less elastic than the original tissue um, that is created. Muscle is categorized as elastic tissue, as well as cartilage and tendons and um, ligaments and aponeuroses, they're all elastic. So we want to be able to um, stretch and return back to a normal position. 
But what happens when you have an injury in a muscle where the tissue becomes fibrotic, it creates a vulnerability on either side of that fibrosis or that adhesion. Uh, much like as if you had a stocking and you um, have a run in it, you know, we put nail polish on and it hardens and it stops the run. It doesn't change the elasticity to the rest of the tissue. However, if we stretched it where that nail polish was, would then create a hole on either side of that hardened area where the rest of the body is elastic. So um, much like with muscles, if you wind up with an injury and then you do not restore elasticity as part of the uh, process in your treatment protocol, there's a potential that the muscle gets so tight, so tight, so tight that when there's an imposed demand that is greater than it can handle, it will evulse and snap right from the bone or tear. So we always want to re go back and restore elasticity. So we wind up with these fascial adhesions uh, to ensure the strength of that tissue. But then there's another thing that happens is that when, where you have uh, in that, that process, you also then have a predisposition closer to the bone for the tendons to wind up to become calcified and or wind up uh, with bony fusions. And the reason is that when you have calcium present everywhere, right, in a muscle, it's present in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, where the calcium comes out and the filaments slide and contraction ensues. It's also present in blood, which is part of the clotting mechanism, and there's plenty of blood in muscles, and it's also present in bone, where the muscle attaches as a hardening agent. The other thing about calcium is it's a natural alkalizing agent. So where you have a lot of acidic deposits, your body is trying to neutralize that acidity by bringing calcium into the area. When you think about that, uh, even when we're looking at things like uh, muscle cramps, usually it's, it's not so much of a metabolic insufficiency. It could be due to an accumulation of waste product of, that are acidic toxicities. So uh, an example, if you have somebody that's you know, sleeping and in the middle of the night, you know, your body is going through a repertory stage and they wind up by the time your body gets to your legs, usually between three and five o'clock in the morning, you wind up having saying, oh my gosh, we've cleaned up so much stuff during the night while I was sleeping that there's too much waste product going through. We can't eliminate it quick enough. Let's just neutralize that acidity by pulling calcium out of the muscle. And then you wind up with a cramp. And that happens frequently to people who are excessively toxic. They'll wind up with a lot of muscle cramps. So we wind up now talking about the fascia, the sustained contraction, and the waste product. So now what happens? How do we get rid of that? Um, for, before we go further with that, what I also want to uh, make you aware of is that when you wind up with sustained contraction or injury and it's causing you more stress, one of the things that your body secretes is cortisone. And cortisone is there to act as an anti-inflammatory and it's really your body's only response to stress is cortisol. So it doesn't matter what the stress is. It doesn't matter whether it's a physical stress, an emotional stress, a spiritual stress, injurious or pathological stress your body will release cortisol. And the thing about cortisol acting as an anti-inflammatory, it's a hormone and it's fat soluble. And the thing about cortisol is, is that it increases blood sugar. So people who wind up with, um, who have a genetic predisposition to diabetes mellitus, usually the precursor is a giant stressor in their, in their life uh, to cause that uh, diabetes mellitus to occur. So diabetes type two would always happen because of a giant precursor of a stress. So it will cause that. The other thing that happens is that you wind up with this acidic condition, your body's gonna put out a lot of calcium. If it's doing that, the place it's gonna pull calcium out of is the bone. Once you wind up pulling calcium out of the bone to neutralize acidities, what will occur is that you wind up with demineralization of the bone. If that calcium is going into the blood, well, then we have an increase of blood viscosity, blood thickness. So you wind up with hypercalcemia, which is going to cause you to have venostasis, slow, sluggish blood flow. An accumulation of that calcium could potentially create a plaque and or a plaque embolus. Um, it could be a precursor to angina pectoris and or uh, creating a clot that could happen as far as it becoming a pulmonary embolus or, or uh, going up into the brain. So it's really important that we maintain 
um, healthy tissues and, and correct all these injuries so that we don't wind up with any of the other systemic conditions that can occur. Uh, primarily, uh, you know, when we're looking at injury, it's not just musculoskeletal, but very much cardiovascular will occur as well. That's why I was talking about um, coronary disease with the calcium coming out of the bone and entering into the blood. So that we want to be careful about that. So the next thing, and I'm sorry, I'm going from my notes over here, and uh, forgive me, I'm so used to uh, teaching in an uh, one on, or, you know, in an audience where I can see you, and pretty much I'm looking at something that looks like the Brady Bunch screen and is just your names and no pictures. So it's uh, I'm not getting to see anybody or be able to have the interaction um, that I would like. So I know I, I said to wait for the end of the conversation for us to talk and see what goes on, but it's important uh, that I, I just want to let you know why I might be fumpering here. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, so this will occur where you're going to wind up with this injury. So um, when that happens, we want to take, we start with our process of doing massage, and you might have noticed that people wind up with an erythemic response where they turn very red um, after you're doing your massage. Um, if it turns red in initially, you know, that's a hyperemia. That would be an increase of circulation to the tissue, blood vasodilation. And then if it stays red and gets hot and a little swollen, well, that's an erythemic response. That is your body's release of histamines from the tissue cells trying to neutralize the waste product uh, by causing, uh, it will uh, surround the area that you're releasing of waste product and it will bring a migration of white blood cells to the area uh, by creating it to be hot. So the white blood cells will act like little Pac-Man and eat up all of those things that don't belong. So um, one of the things that's important to know when you're looking at somebody when doing medical massage, I don't have low lights on. It's not a Swedish relaxing massage. It's very much specific oriented and region oriented. Um, so that I need to see what's happening with that body. I want to pay attention to color, hydration, respiration, uh, density, things of that nature. So when I see that they're turning red uh, a lot and showing an erythemic response, uh, it's letting you know, uh, mostly if they're not uh, uh, fair skinned or red, red hair or, or blonde or light, light eyed, fair skinned, light eyes, what happens is they have a natural, um, it turning red is, is natural for them. They have increased capillary permeability. So uh, with everyone else, it usually is because of a toxic response. If they're very toxic, and we can't say that they're toxic. It's a metabolic response that we're releasing waste products into the tissue that is, it's too much. So we don't want to say, hey, you know, you're showing a toxic reaction, but it could decrease my treatment time so that I'm not going to overload them for the body to have to metabolize everything that I just released. Now, when we think about these things, well, what could happen, you know, in, in, just doing a prolonged application or wanting to work, you know, I see people that will do uh, not just trigger point therapy, but they'll, they'll like want to lay a lay elbow in them and call it deep tissue and their deep tissue is their medical massage and they're creating crushes and um, going really deep and, and it's somewhat uncomfortable and painful. It doesn't have to be that uncomfortable or painful for you to have a response that that is therapeutic. You don't need to have that type of situation occur. So you just have to be sensitive and know what it is that you're looking at. Okay, thank you so much, hi back. Okay, so there's there's techniques that, that have been shared actually with um, Janet Chevel in her book, Myofascial Pain and Dysfunction. The first 64 pages of her Apropos of Muscle, she talked about um, twitch contractions and how to shut a contraction off. But she also was laborious over talking about some uh, processes and techniques or neurological, physiological processes as in the Arnschultz law. So I want to talk to you about some of uh, the things that we could do and what we, to take care of some of these conditions. All right, now we're coming up on um, 627. So I might take an extra 10 minutes if you guys are all right with that. So what she talked about was the Arnschild's Law. The Arnschild's Law states that short stimuli initiate cellular function and prolonged inhibits it. So uh, what happens is with a prolonged application, you know, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds or more, you're going to wind up with the release of endorphins and you wind up sedating the tissue. Um, when you do a short application, somewhere between seven and 10 seconds is the uh, number she was putting out, is that, you know, you initiate cellular function. 
So with that's important, now we have timing. We don't have to be prolonged and work an hour on a body part to do every petrissage, every effleurage, everything that we know how to do in that area. We just need to go in and get out within a very short period of time. Um, what she talked about, so we want to shut off a sustained contraction. Muscles do that, they say sustain. So if you think about that, what happens is that she did that by initiating a twitch contraction. She stated there are three different ways to do a twitch. And a twitch contraction, the definition is when a whole muscle organ reaches a threshold of a stimulus that every fiber contracts fully, and then in the latent period, every fiber relaxes fully. So with that, I mean, that's paramount information for clinical application. You want to shut those contractions off. She talked about doing a cross fiber friction at the bony attachments, simulating the Golgi tendon organs to stopping the tension or sensing tension. And then she also said by compressing the belly of the muscle as you would the SCM, and that would um, shut off the muscle spindles. And another way is to do a deep perpendicular effleurage to the direction of the muscle fibers. So think about that. If this is a muscle contraction and we have waste product on the inside being metabolites, if I shut the contraction off, all the waste product falls out. So that we wind up with reducing the amount of tissue waste by shutting a contraction off. So the, those are two things that we could deal with, with just uh, taking care of the four things that we treat. Another way to shut off uh, muscle contraction is by doing muscle energy techniques. There are a whole bunch of them that are out there, but a real simple one in reciprocal inhibition basically is that your muscles of opposition in action are on the same nerve on the same nerve supply. So in essence, when you go to contract your biceps, your triceps have to relax. Otherwise the movement looks like this, really shaky. So when we go to contract our biceps, we don't contract with every forceful fiber contracting fully. Therefore in the muscles of opposition, we don't relax them fully. But if we were to contract against resistance and recruit more fibers to contract in bicep contraction, we recruit more fibers of the muscle of opposition to relax. So another way to shut off a contraction is via using muscle energy techniques, and there are tons of them. So what remains besides uh, it, in addressing the muscle contraction, we have the twitch and we have muscle energy techniques. This is real simple information. Uh, the waste product will go away once, or it will be uh, mostly reduced once you shut the contraction off. Um, as far as then the fascia and the elasticity, uh, we can then do other techniques that are fascial, fascially inclined. So John Barnes does a great class in myofascial work, but it doesn't stay within the confines of Arnold Schultz. It's a very slow uh, process of positions of opposition done very slowly, but very effectively over a prolonged period of time. But in medical massage, we are uh, constricted via body parts and time frames of 15 minute units with a maximum of one hour in treatment protocol. So the next thing you might want to deal with is the fascia. So you could do fascial um, manipulations as a pin and stretch, stretch, also known as a fascial kinetic, where you allow the sliding surfaces to slide. Um, there's also uh, such things as fascial ringing, as you were to grab the tissue and ring it around a vertical axis to hard and feel hold for about 10 seconds and then take it further um, to have further stretch. And then you could pick the tissue up and fascially bend it. Um, cupping is also an example of the usage of cups now. Everybody's using them. Um, it seems to be very popular. That acts very similar to petrissage. It breaks up subcutaneous adhesions. So um, those are the ways to deal with fascia. Um, also, by doing so, it restores elasticity, along with you doing ranges of motion where you could perform them, call them a range of motion, and take them into a stretch. And certainly, if they're doing any type of muscle energy technique, you can take them into a post-isometric stretch upon release. So we have discussed medical massage reasons why, we have discussed what could happen, and we discussed the techniques that can uh, reverse the process and or help in reparation of the tissues that you're treating. And there we have my time. Are there any questions that anybody would say or have? Well, thank you, Shamaya, first of all. And um, hopefully people are going to be submitting their questions via chat. Um, you've provided so much information. Thank you so much for um, for your talk tonight. And uh, you know, what I'd like to know is, are, are you back to doing 
live workshops or if people are, I see your email address right below your name. If people are, are interested in, in learning. Um, um, yeah, I just started again. I had actually retired from the massage industry a couple of years ago um, and I got into a different business. And however, now that COVID has hit, um, you know, everything has become obsolete. So I was fortunate enough to be working as a, an assistant for LMT Success Group on Zoom conferences and webinars that they have created. And then I just did my uh, first two live classes in Florida this last month. I am going to be doing a live class in Las Vegas with the LMT Success School doing uh, performing in their medical massage and giving other lectures while I'm there and then going down to uh, Costa Rica and teaching there. Um, but I'm anxious to get back in. I've missed this industry. It's, it has defined me for 44 years. So it's, it's really nice to be back and be able to share the uh, skills that I have and to know that I'm still relevant. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think you are. But um, I, I haven't seen any questions come in. Yeah, so, I don't know. Um, now, oh, here's one. Is medical massage a separate certification? Um, she has a friend that advertises uh, medical massage, but only went to regular massage school. You know, there's a lot uh, to do about that. You know, anybody could be a certifying body. I, I do know that the uh, more popular uh, practitioners, you know, Whitley Lowe um, and uh, James Wislowski are with a group of practitioners that are teaching a program that they're calling medical massage and going over uh, very in-depth applications. The information that is taught with LMC Success Group is more superficial and then it goes into the advanced medical massage. But it's anyone could give you a certification. Any of the classes are listed individually as uh, the days are like an eight-hour class. They're listed individually and then they combine them for you to take all of them in a sequence so that you can then get their medical massage certification. Um, I find it Without a test, you know, when I was a younger practitioner, I have gone through all of Paul St. John's uh, classes uh, before, you know, um, you know, before he went off into doing his other things. But um, there was tests that we had to take and we had to do practicals. And I've gone through uh, active release technique and you have tests that you have to take and a practical and a written uh, to give you the validation that you know what you're doing. So um, when people say that they're a medical massage practitioner, I just really find it to be important that they have a, a, an acute understanding of anatomy and physiology, what they're touching, what the outcome of it, what they're touching, is it going to cause any harm? Um, you know, the reason we have licensing is to protect the public, period, because um, we wouldn't need one if what we did could not pose a detriment to the population. So you do need a, I would go through a class, um, you know, I would probably take numerous classes, not just the ones from LMT Success Group. I would go through orthopedic massage with James Wislowski. I would take anything with Tom Myers. Um, uh, Sandy Frist would be great. Um, there's a ton of really great people that are out there that really give very in-depth classes that require you to have a uh, pre-education or pre-knowledge to what it is they're going to be presenting. Um, well, you answered one of the questions that came in about more information on the courses you teach, and it sounds like LMT Success Group. And um, also, repeat the name of the author to the book you referenced. Now, I think you, the last name was Becker. I beg your pardon? Dr. I, Robert Becker. Uh, yeah, Dr. Robert Becker, The Body Electric. And I think that was the only book you referenced. Uh, am I correct? Uh, no, I referenced Janet Travell, Myofascial Pain and Dysfunction, the Trigger Point Therapy Manual. Those big oh, okay. red fat books, the two volumes. Um, also, if anybody had an opportunity, if they wanted to get more into the medical massage practice, I would absolutely recommend taking anything with Gil Headley. Um, oh, wonderful. Who, uh, does so monots. He, he does amazing dissection classes. He's the one who did the fuzz speech. He's uh, really true the trigger point therapy manual. Those big oh, okay. red fat books, the two volumes. Um, also, if anybody had an opportunity, if they wanted to get more into the medical massage practice, I would absolutely recommend taking anything with Gil Headley. Um, oh, wonderful. Who, uh, does so monots. He, 
He does amazing dissection classes. He's the one who did the fuzz speech. He's uh, really. Whoops, are you there? Okay. He's, um, I'm, I'm gonna mute myself for just one second. Okay. I'm sorry, I had to tell my family to stop talking. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, the person is um, asking how you can find my information for courses. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I, 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 I was saw just through say, LMT Success Group or your email address is right, right there on the screen. Now, I would say um, contact oh, directly. Say that again, Shamaya. Contact me directly via email. Okay. Now, um, the notes you were working from tonight, uh, those will be available to um, our attendees? Yes. And I'll get out to Okay. Your sound um, has been breaking up. So. Um, Is it better now? How about now? Yes, it's much better now. Okay. So I, I don't see that any other questions have come in. Um, someone did mention that they took a class with James and it changed their practice, um, which leads me into again thanking the audience and saying we have some wonderful edu talks coming up um, in in May and uh, June, and in fact James Waslowski is on the June schedule. So May 18th we have Carrie D'Ambrosio with total body screening examination on May 18th. June 8th, we have Doug Nelson, The Art of Clinical Decision-Making. June 15th, we have James Wislowski, Integrated Manual Therapy for Lower Back, Hip, and Sciatica. And June 22nd, we have Judith Koch Stapleton uh, presenting prenatal massage why specialized training matters. Um, a question did come in, the terms certificate and certification are often confused. To my knowledge, there is not a certifying body specific for medical massage. Instead, a certificate, that just went away. Instead, a, a certificate of completion is provided by the educator. And yes, this um, Shamaya's EduTalk has been recorded. I will be sending out the link to the recording tomorrow. And um, Shamaya has offered to include um, her notes um, that will be attached in that email as well. So um, visit us um, for our upcoming EduTalks and all EduTalks are recorded and posted to the EduTalk library on the biotone.com website. Thank you so much for thank attending you. everyone and thank you Shamaya. I, there was so much information um, for me as a lay person to take in and uh, it sounds fascinating. So um, I hope it was very inspirational for a lot of our audience to learn thank more. You. Thank you and uh, again, thank you everyone and join us again for ed upcoming EduTalks. Perfect. Thank Take you care. so much. Okay. Bye-bye.